Okay. So before we get started with the program, I do have some announcements to make, of course. Um, for those of you not familiar with the Social Documentary Network, and I know there's some new faces here today, we were founded in 2008 as a global community of documentary photographers, editors, curators, NGOs, journalists, and others who believe in the power of visual storytelling. In addition to this program today, Documentary Matters, our other programs include the SDN website that has featured more than 3,500 documentary exhibits on diverse themes from all parts of the world. And we're now publishing our 13th issue of Zeke Magazine due out in April. This is a special issue on Bangladesh, but will also include a portfolio, portfolio of images from the recent uh, US Capitol riots by photographer Marini Ray Staub. Um, we have an active education program as well with classes starting next week. Photographer Ed Kashi is teaching a class beginning on February 18th, which I believe still has one seat left. Michael Snyder is teaching a very popular class on telling stories that matter that begins this Thursday. And for the first time, we're launching the SDN Documentary Photography Reviews on April 3rd, bringing together 25 leading editors, curators, publishers, and um, photographers. And information on these and all of our programs can be found on the SDN website at www.socialdocumentary.net. We have with us here today three photographers from the former Soviet Union, two from Russia and one from Belarus. Nadia Sablin and Misha Friedman now live in the US, but their work focuses on Russia and the former Soviet Union. Sergei Ponomarev lives and works in Russia and has been covering events in Russia, Eastern Europe, and the Middle East for the New York Times and other major publications. Of the three, Nadia is clearly most in the documentary and fine art camp, exhibiting her work in galleries and museums. Sergey is a working photojournalist, and you'll see his images on the pages of the New York Times and other major media. Misha straddles both worlds, as he does, as he does both journalism and self-directed documentary uh, projects, often resulting in books, which we'll be talking about today. I also want to talk about um, the core concept of this program, Documentary Matters. We, as lovers of the photographic image, relish in the visual and formal qualities of the work of these photographers. We take pleasure in the pastoral beauty of the photographs of Nadia's relatives living in a rural village in Northwest Russia, as much as we take pleasure in the gritty images by Misha of TB patients, alternative theater, or LGBTQ communities in places where it is illegal and can be dangerous. And we appreciate the solid compositions, deliberate colors, whispers of comedy, hammers of reality, and the raw content in the photographs by one of the leading photojournalists working today, now bringing us the story of the moment in Russia, equivalent to events such as Tahrir Square, Tiananmen Square, the Maidan, and the Black Lives Matter protests. Um, we were just talking with Sergey earlier before the meeting started, and he said that uh, the protests have really come down today and probably won't be continuing through the winter, but we'll hear more about that in a few minutes. To, to each of these photographers, or for SDN in general, the medium is not the message. The medium is what the medium is meant to be, a path, a pass through to a deeper and fuller understanding. For SDN, this is central to our belief in documentary. Art does not exist for art's sake. Art matters and thus documentary matters. What can we learn from these images about this great nation spanning continents, once Russia, then the Soviet Union, and now a smaller, fractured, but ambitious and expansionist Russia again. A people that has spawned many of the greatest creative and scientific minds, as well as having embarked on the riskiest challenge of humanity to break all norms and customs and attempt to forge a society exalting the toiling classes, but only to fail and instead descend into the worst gulags of the 20th century, and now trying to recreate itself. And today, as we ponder what does this mean, people in Russia are once again forging history in their protests against Vladimir Putin. To each of these photographers, I've asked the same question, perhaps an impossible question for an artist whose works are based on the visual language, not the language of words. Please share with us your images, but also help us understand what these images mean to you 
and what they can mean to us. What drives you to take these particular images in your particular style? What is it in your head, heart, and soul that you hope, that you hope to capture using this visual language of photography? Our first speaker today will be Nadia Sablin. Nadia was born in Russia in 1980 and moved to the US in 1992. She received her BFA from Rochester Institute of Technology and an MFA from Arizona State University. Her ongoing projects are primarily based in rural Russia and Ukraine, where she served in the Peace Corps. Nadia has received grants and fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the New York Foundation for the Arts and others. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, The Guardian, The Moscow Times, Slate, and The New Yorker. Her photographs have been seen in solo and groups exhibitions across the US, including the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Southeast Museum of Photography, Blue Sky Gallery in Oregon, the Cleveland Museum of Art, among others. Sablin's first monograph, Aunties, was published by Duke University Press, the Center for Documentary Studies in 2015. She teaches photography at the State University of New York in New Paltz. And today she'll talk about her project, Aunties, photographed over seven summers in a small village in Northwest Russia, where her two aunts, Alevtina and Lamilla, are from. Okay, Nadia, and you'll need to unmute yourself, yeah. Great. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, I'm going to share my screen with you. Is it working? Yep. Okay. So um, thank you all for coming. Um, the story I'm going to tell you is very small, quiet, and very personal. And it starts in, um, in the 90s with a picture that my father took of me as a small girl standing in front of a road sign, a welcome sign to the village where he grew up and where I used to spend my summers uh, until in 92, my family immigrated to America. This village is not that remote. It's uh, probably about four hours by car from St. Petersburg, but back then by bus, by multiple buses, it took hours and it seemed like another world. Um, in the States, I wasn't sure that I would ever be able to return to Russia and when I did, St. Petersburg became a very different place than I had remembered it. And so I decided to come back to the village um, of my childhood summers to see if I could find any connection with my homeland there. This is another photograph by my father of me and my grandfather. The house uh, where we used to spend our summers uh, was built by my grandfather um, twice. Uh, it had to be moved at a certain point and it had to be floated down a river and reconstructed. When I came back in my late twenties, I found that the house was still there. Um, and I found that a lot of my childhood memories such as the numbers etched into the logs were still there. It was a really um, powerful moment for me. I, did, I don't think I realized just how much I had missed Russia um, as a place. I don't think I realized just how much was missing from my daily life, the smells, the sounds, um, the memories, just really, um, they really changed the way that I uh, saw myself and the way that I understood my life. And this project was really important to me as an image maker um, and as a human as well. The house still smelled the same. It still looked the same. It had most of the same objects that I remembered from when I was eight and nine and 10. If you lifted the tablecloth, you could still see stains from um, jam making from decades ago. And it reminded me of blood. And I understood that it was my blood um, that was in this place. Um, and that the part of me had remained there this whole time. Also in this house, um, even though my grandfather had died, um, two of my older aunts still spent half a year um, growing food, taking care of the property, taking care of each other. And I thought I was coming for a brief family visit, maybe to reconnect with the place, see what I could find, maybe take some pictures. But as soon as I entered the house and met my aunts, 
I understood that this was something, something much bigger and much more important. I understood that I wanted to make a book of photographs of these two women um, to learn their story, to observe them. And I started kind of following them around and seeing how they lived. Um, every day had a specific rhythm. Seasons had rhythms as well. Um, and the way that they moved to the house reminded me of a kind of a ballet. Every morning they would get up and braid their hair. Um, the house was constructed before electricity was a really sure thing. So the way that it's put together um, is so that the light coming from the sun is exactly in the place where you need it to be in order to make um, food or do your chores. The sun starts in the kitchen where my older aunt, Eliftina, would uh, make the day's meals. After the dew would dry, um, weeds would need to be pulled, grass would need to be cut down. There would be a lot of work to do. The house doesn't have uh, water. Art festival, Lagos Photo Festival, the diaspora rise up, Y-I-A-G-A -A Africa. Hi, can a somebody Africa mute themselves? Among others, and has been exhibited at the first Canon alumni exhibition, as well as the Alliance uh, Front says. I'm going to mute everybody. Benson's, image, Benson's images have been featured. Thank you, Glenn. Um, yeah, so the house has no running water and whatever water you need for cleaning, washing, cooking has to be brought in by hand. Okay, Benson, um, unmute yourself and take it away. I think we have interference from another- Can everyone hear me? Yes. Uh, All right. Everybody. Um, my name is Benson, Benson of uh... All right, I muted everybody again. We're trying to have two talks. Um, I'm competing with Benson. One is started in Lagos. Um, yeah. I'll be sharing some slides, and I would like to go through the slides. I, I don't know what to do about this. Um, Nadi, why don't you try coming in again? OK. Um, all right. So. Every day, there's a number of chores that have to be performed. They vary by season, but uh, what doesn't stop is the continuous doing of something, of, of caring, of making, of cleaning, of supporting. Um, and then there's tea time that happens every day at the same time. Very few um, conversations happen organically. There's maybe some facts exchanged, um, mention of the weather or relatives, um, discussion of what to plant or what to gather next. And each sister has her own chores to do. Aliftina does all the cooking and Dudmila does the cleaning. I tried to stay back and observe. Um, the few times that I tried to be a participant in their actions, I got shooed away and told to go do my own work, that everybody had their own place and their own uh, duties and mine was to photograph. Uh, so I wasn't allowed to help with domestic labor. <laughs> Perhaps they were afraid I wouldn't be any good at it. In the afternoon after dinner or lunch, um, there's always more things to be done. Here's Ludmila measuring cloth for a new house dress. She makes uh, all of the clothes for both sisters. There are berries to be clipped and punctured for jam. There's a slowness and a deliberateness to each action that the aunts take. The wood needs to be stacked in order to dry. The berries need to be punctured in order to be made into jam. There are multiple steps and processes that my aunts um, have really dialed into with precision, but also grace and beauty. And from them, I learned this quiet method of working, of observing, of going through the steps, of allowing room for humor, um, for magic, um, and for a lot of memories from my own childhood. I spent 
many hours reading in the attic of this house. Um, and all those books, all those stories that I had read became part of the landscape that I now uh, was observing as an adult. And for me, Russia is a, it's a really strange place. It's, it's not home, but it's, it's a place of memory. It's a place that I don't quite understand, uh, but love in some ways. And it's a place that's kind of um, a conduit to magic, maybe, or a conduit to myself when I believed in magic. So I went back um, many years in a row. Um, even after I stopped working on this project, I kept going back for years and making images in this village and other places um, to continue this exploration of this world, these people, uh, my aunts, their neighbors, their friends, people like them in similar locations, looking at the light, looking at um, how they feel. <laughs> Toward the evening, the light um, enters the living room and at 6 p.m. the samovar gets lit so that we can have tea again. And this routine, um, this everyday repetition of things, surely keeps my aunts tethered to their reality, to their garden, to, to each other, or kept, I should say. They do have some leisure time when they can do crosswords and watch TV together. But again, most of that time is spent quietly um, in companionate silence. The light makes its way around the house. And by the end of the day, um, probably at 1130, you see the last rays enter into the kitchen again, but from a different side. Lucky that the white nights are so long. And then this meditative process with my aunts, by following them through their daily rituals, by going on adventures with them through this post-Soviet wasteland that reminded me of Tarkovsky's films. I think I understood um, more about how to see, more about how to love also. These near strangers to me, whom I remembered as odd characters from my childhood became very, very close people. And through loving them, through seeing them, um, I think I was able to make the photographs that I that I made. I'm showing you a couple of the adventures that we went on to gather blueberries or this one when the fence broke to get new planks. In following them around the village, I started learning more about their environment, how the village was functioning, how people live in places with so little industry. Um, and that propelled me into my next project that I won't talk to you about today. Um, this is a sawmill that's behind the house. And what was really incredible to me about these two women was how resilient they were and how self-sufficient. Um, they were two elderly women doing physical labor, um, even though they were quite small and frail and surviving, growing their own food, making their own clothing, um, being strong in their own way. And it gave me uh, a lot of hope and a lot of um, appreciation for them, for us, for us as humanity maybe. Um, and it, it made me want to learn more about, um, more about us people, to photograph more people, to hear more stories, to see more beauty in the world. I'm going to end there. Well, thank you for that extraordinary presentation of those extraordinarily beautiful photographs. And um, they really demonstrate your love for your aunts. Um, we, we have a few minutes left. Um, maybe just tell us what is your next project? So while I was photographing the aunts, uh, sometimes they would get quite tired of me. Um, they are shy people and having a camera always stuck in their face uh, is probably not very comfortable. 
So they would kick me out of the house and send me away. Um, and I would start, I started photographing kids around the village, landscapes, and slowly that turned into a 10 year project about this village, um, which I'm working on now still. Oh, so that's that's so the next book. But with different subject matter then? Different people um, looking more at the infrastructure, looking more at um, labor and difficulties um, and other aspects of life, not just two people in a familial home. Well, we look forward to seeing that work in the future. Is any of that on your website now? Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's called tentatively titled Years Like Water. Great. All right, we'll look forward to seeing that. All right, thank you, Nadia. Really appreciate that. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is Misha Friedman. Misha was born in Moldova in 1977 and emigrated to the U.S. with his parents. He graduated with degrees from Binghamton University in New York and the London School of Economics, where he'd studied economics and Russian politics. He worked in finance in New York and after 9-11 switched careers to volunteer as a project manager at Doctors Without Borders while teaching himself photography. Um, and this is where he started his career doing extraordinary work of TB patients. Misha regularly collaborates with leading international media and nonprofit organizations. His widely exhibited work has received numerous awards, including multiple grants from the Pulitzer Center. He has four monographs and his most recent book, Two Women in Their Time, The Belarus Free Theater and the Art of Resistance was published in 2020 by the New Press and is reviewed in the upcoming issue of Zeke Magazine. And this book is a collaboration with writer Masha Gessen, whom he, uh, Misha works with frequently. Okay, Masha. Um, you'll have to unmute yourself. I mean, Misha, I'm sorry, I said Masha, <laughs> I meant Misha. Um, let's see, okay, you're unmuted. Yeah, how uh, can you see this? Uh, okay, yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, I thank you, Glenn. Um, I was thinking about like what I wanted to show and tell, and how I want to talk about some of the things that I've been doing in Belarus. And kind of a funny thing happened last year where the book that I was working on uh, was photographed mainly from 2017 to 2019, when I, when the book was done, uh, protests broke out in Belarus and I was happened to be there in August and September of last year. And the one thing that I couldn't help but feel and notice being there was how, you know, there's this expression kind of life imitates art, uh, but most of the time it's a throwaway kind of a cliche phrase that means very little. But having photographed political theater company in Belarus and per performing in Belarus and abroad, what I couldn't help but notice was how protests were in fact imitating or rhyming with a lot of the political plays that I observed and photographed over the years. And so what I decided to do for today as a sort of an experiment was to juxtapose some of the images that I photographed on the streets in reality and some of the you know things from play from the place plus my the protagonists of my book and just to see how that would work and also um, yeah so let's uh, you know because most of the time you have people like events happen and then books are written, songs are composed and plays are performed. And that's how the message kind of continues by activists and artists kind of incorporate activists into their work. While I felt like to a certain extent, it was, Belarus was a curious case of the opposite where you have a theater company that would put on these plays and attempt to, to remind people that Belarus exists. And this is something that people should be aware of the, of the dictatorship there, that the last dictator of Europe is not a throwaway phrase. And then actual kind of protests happen. Uh, so without further ado, uh, so here is 
kind of a, an image from a protest last September, August. This was on the election night uh, in Minsk. And that's uh, one, of, one of my protagonists, Vitlana, uh, re rehearsing uh, a play. Uh, one of the things I learned in spending a lot of time in the theater is never call what never say practice. They say never like we don't practice, we rehearse. So I've been trained to never to say practice for theater. Everything is rehearsal, never practice. Um, uh, this is this was kind of a kind of a horrific scene. Uh, people didn't know what to expect. This was the evening of the elections, which uh, people came out to protest and uh, riot police were kind of ready for them. In this, what I found interesting later talking to this couple with the newborn uh, was how it was actually, because I was wondering as a father myself, like how, would, how does that happen? How do they have the, like, this, the courage and the strength to take a newborn to the protest? And it's actually the mother, because I can't imagine a scenario where a dad would say, Let's go to this rally with a three month with a three month old, and taking his like wife and child with them. But it was actually it's the mom who would, didn't want to leave. It was the mom who was like insisted on having the right to be there. And that's uh, that's from a play, uh, a political play, a few years before that. And that's what it, that's what that scene looked like. In reality, on in early August, yeah, they weren't. Police were not messing around, as you can see. Uh, yeah, this was a kind of a scene, something that you would kind of read about in history books from about, I don't know, the, the gulags and the repressions and the, or the Pinochet in the 70s in Chile, where this was an ambulance at the detention center. The, the following day after thousands were arrested and in fact disappeared and relatives would gather outside of the detention center waiting for any sort of news. So the most, the most savagely beaten protesters were then taken to a hospital because they were on the brink of dying and the relatives would storm ambulances waiting to receive any kind of news um, or any kind of bits of information or just the last name of the person in the car, just anything because all internet was shut down in the country, so there was no information about anything. So what you mostly see here are like mothers, sisters, husbands uh, of the detained. The sort of protest images that I like, that I'm interested in, like to go for are where, you know, it, it, it's on an intellectual level, it's, relatively easy or straightforward to say, here are the protesters, here are the cops, here are the good, here are the bad, this is white and this is black. And the sort of things that I tend to gravitate to are where things are not necessarily clear or where people have doubts. So what I saw in this woman's face was where on the one hand, she came out to kind of, you know, she's a protester, but she's not with people carrying flags, she has doubts, like she's really worried. She's really worried that are these people marching to, to their glory or to death or detention. And so the, those were kind of both tears of joy and also kind of something that a mother would feel to her children going off into the night. This is one of my protagonists at home. And uh, the way this, these two, like the two, the lesbian couple that I followed kind of built their life was 
they work in town, they, uh, they, uh, they run a theater company, but then they built a home about an hour from Minsk uh, in a village without a name uh, to be as far away from everyone as possible and to kind of live, live there, have a home halfway to the border with Lithuania, just you know, to be, and from time to time, shelter some well-known political activists from both Belarus and Russia, who have who have like overnighted in their kind of unknown village. This was also kind of moving. So this was during the protest in August where you had a group of women came out to support. Like it was, yeah, I mean, at some, very quickly in Minsk, there was a, there were kind of rallies and then there were kind of women-led rallies. So this was kind of a difficult scene to witness because on the one hand, it was great to see kind of a two dozen women out there in the middle of the day kind of showing their solidarity. But then when I tried to take this woman's uh, photograph, she asked to kind of not be, for her face to be obscured. Like she was still afraid. She was still afraid of being identified. I think she's either like a, in high school or maybe, maybe a college student. And so it was very sad where on the one hand you have all these scenes of kind of solidarity and joy and and hope of change yet on a very personal level she was like nope i'm here but i'm not so it was a kind of a poignant scene for me as a as a journalist as a person to kind of witness so she found this placard which she to which she covered her face this is my other kind of protagonist Sveta. This is a, a grandmother mourning the death of her, uh, of her grandson uh, in in middle of August. Uh, she, he was one of the first people kind of who was savagely he he would disappear and then he was found hanged in the forest. Uh, and about ten days later, and authorities of course said that it was suicide. That's his funeral. And that's his widow. This was another, that's, that's the same funeral, but I'm kind of really kind of proud of this photograph where, because you have this funeral procession and you know, when, you, when you're covering a news event, it's kind of hard to sometimes remove yourself from the event and kind of look around. And, while there was a lot of talk about a revolution in Belarus, what I saw was there was still, there were a lot of, like every, like it's normal for people, some people to be undecided, some people to be on the sidelines. And some people were really all in while others were still hedging their bets. So I spotted this woman in a nice kind of car with a protest flag inside her car, looking at the procession, which I thought was kind of symbolic of what I was seeing in the country as a whole, where some, some were already burying their martyrs, while others, they had a flag out, but from the comforts of their German kind of sedans, kind of observing, but not, not, not being there with them. Uh, this is a policeman trying to intimidate a protester. Um, and while another cop is filming, very filming her. This is one of my protagonists. From the book. This is from a play about police violence. Uh, which I photographed three years before that in Minsk. Uh, this is Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, who 
Whose name took me about a week to memorize myself. I didn't know who she was when I first got to Minsk myself. Uh, She's a she became kind of a long makes the long story short. She she became a kind of a default de facto presidential candidate herself. But then she was forced to flee. Uh, Here a few days before election, she's recording kind of a campaign last second campaign video. What I found kind of funny and kind of ironic and interesting here was that the, the studio where we were filming this, they wanted her to appear a little bit taller for the camera. So they used some like old books for her to stand on. What I thought was cute was it just happened to, they just happened to be the Soviet, Soviet encyclopedias. So I thought it was pretty symbolic for her to be standing on Soviet encyclopedias. These are my protagonists uh, in me in Kiev. What I've, what was interesting about them was how my how much more relaxed and together they seemed appear to be when they were on the road when they were in Minsk. So riot policeman. Kind of just a picture I like from Minsk. The uh, this theater company, when they are abroad in places like New York, they perform in some of the most like important stages, theater festivals in the world. But when they are in Minsk, they perform in, the, in this garage, like the underground garage in the out, uh, outskirts of town. So that this is after one of the performances. The founders of the theater are in, are in exile in London. So after one of the shows, they kind of be doing the Q&A with the crowd. Sometimes kind of a well-known people perform with the theater. This is Maria Alyokhina of Pussy Riot, uh, who you may have heard of uh, during one of the rehearsals. That's also her. Uh, this is, these are my protagonists. They kind of, they're, all, the, all the, the, the plays are free in Minsk. This is to make the authorities Kind of, this is to make the theater a little bit more harder to go after by authorities because if you don't charge money for your place, it's harder for tax police to kind of audit you. So all their all their plays are free. They advertise online. People call in to reserve their spots. And that's what they're doing. Again, the sort of play that they perform. It's another play, kind of. Sometimes they perform outdoors in people's private properties. This is 2019. When they are abroad, it's again, it's much bigger stages. It's, you know, they, this was Sensov, a Ukrainian uh, director who was jailed in Russia for five years. So they were doing a lot of activism on his behalf. Um, this is my, kind of my couple in their village and, uh, Last but not least, so my book came out in December, so just last, just a month ago. And as a last slide, this is the, the cover. And I apologize if I went a little bit over, if I spoke too long. Uh, and I'd be happy to, you know, the book is part of a larger book series about gay couples uh, all around the world. And this book is dedicated to the theater, to them. And, uh, and you know, there's a 9,000 word uh, essay by Masha Gessen, who normally writes for the New Yorker, and uh, the the essay is worth the price of the book. Hello, uh, thank you. Wow, thank you, Misha. That, that was really extraordinary. Uh, like documentary matters, certainly theater matters. In this case, it's a real life and death death situation there. Um, looking through your book earlier, it really, it focuses on the theater. Um, the demonstration pictures, have they been published anywhere? A uh, little here and there. Uh, there was demand for them in August when there was not much going on in terms of COVID and US elections. Uh, but then that quickly died as soon as, uh, I think, 
the day they like Belarus died and were in U.S. news was when uh, Biden announced Kamala to be his to be his VP, and then uh, kind of the last campaign season began, and and then COVID kind of picked up in September, and Belarus kind of died from as as news. Uh, so there was a spike of interest in August. In, in August, and uh, I mean, a lot of these were shot for Getty images and a little bit for New York Times. So they appeared as news photographs at the time, uh, but then uh, the way news goes, uh, it, they, became, uh, they became old news uh, fairly quickly. Do the women in the theater um, fear for fear of being arrested? They were. They were, in fact, arrested. They, uh, there were articles about them written. Uh, they were arrested on, on, on election night and they spent uh, like a few horrible, horrible days uh, in detention at that detention facility. And they came out like completely different people. Like, and uh, they were so, like, I really understood what it meant when people say that you know, like you're a shell of your former self. Again, it was just an, an, an expression for me before, but you know, they're strong, they're independent, they're on the theater company, as you guys, as some of you I'm sure know, people who work in theater, they're very, they can do everything. when they're used to being extremely flexible and, and they, you could see it was them, but it was not them. And they were very, they shut down completely for a while. Uh, I helped some like foreign journalists, like I connected it, them to them and they interviewed them and I did not want to photograph them because I saw how, like they actually used some of the images from the book that were not published before because the book was not out to illustrate like articles about them in places like The Guardian. Uh, but I just didn't want to like I, you know, like I've spent years with them. They're my friends. They're distraught. Uh, Marsha Gesson wrote about them in the New Yorker. Again, they use some stock images, and and uh, they were yeah. They're still, you know, they're still recovering from those wounds. Um, and wish them our best. Thank you. Um, and. Um, we will have a Q&A at the end, so please hold all your questions until the end for all three speakers. Our last speaker is Sergei Panamerev. Sergei was born in Moscow in 1980 and began work for the Associated Press in 2003 before becoming a freelance photographer and frequent contributor for the New York Times. He's best known for his photojournalism works depicting Russian daily life and culture, as well as news images from wars and conflicts in the Middle East, including Syria, Gaza, Lebanon, Egypt, and Libya. And he's won many international and domestic photography awards. Most recently, he was part of a winning team for a Pulitzer Prize in photography in the breaking news category. He's also won first place in the general news category at World Press Photo for the European refugee crisis. He was a finalist at the Pulitzer Prize in 2015 and third place in the war category. In these last few weeks, Sergei has been covering the pro Navalny protests in Moscow and the security forces response. I hope he'll tell us more about this today. And a few days ago during a Zoom call, I asked Sergei if he can tell us what these pictures mean to him. His response was that it was too soon to know since the events are still happening and too fresh in his mind. In many cases, the images may need to speak for themselves. Okay, Sergei. Okay, I'm unmuting myself. Um, hello, everybody, and uh, thanks for coming. And I see that you are here in the great numbers, and I really uh, appreciate your time and the coming and listening to our, uh, to our words and uh, our stories. Um, I would like to show you uh, a couple of projects. One of them that was me mentioned by Glenn, the uh, process that sparked uh, just recently in uh, Russia after a return back uh, home of the one of the opposition leaders uh, mm, who was recovering after 
poisoning uh, by the nerve agents uh, late earlier in the summer. And uh, what happened uh, after that? But uh, before that, I wanted to show you a project that uh, happened with me just a few months ago. And I thought that, well, that's probably not the best time for that project. But uh, once I uh, delve into that, and uh, I just realized that it's a huge story that, uh, and huge and very untold story that we probably all need to uh, to know. And uh, it's a, and a very essential topic, it's uh, climate change. And uh, well, I was asked to uh, do an assignment for the New York Times Magazine uh, a few months ago, and it was uh, at the beginning of uh, winter, um, in November and I thought like, okay, the climate change, it's something about the global warming and um, what's the reason to do that in winter? It's probably, well, visually you will not see any change. Uh, but as soon as I dove uh, and I engaged with that story, I saw that probably visually it's the best way to show how, to, how the land changed uh, during the winter. So um, let me sh share the screen and show you some pictures from that project. And uh, as it goes, I'll read, read a, a little bit of the, uh, the text about that. So the climate change and enormous human migrations will transform the ag agriculture and remake the world order. And no country stands to gain more than Russia. Excuse Agricultural- Seeing your images, are you meaning to share them? Aren't you seeing them? Uh, no, no. Okay, so um, I'm just using this preview and what do, what do you see then? Oh, uh, I need to share a screen, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. A little bit, yeah, okay. It's a little bit different from uh, Google Hangouts uh, that I used to use. Okay, so do you see images guys? Yeah, yep, that okay, looks awesome. Yeah. So, and the agriculture offers the um, um, uh, the key to one of the greatest resources of the new climate era, which is food. And in the recent years, Russia has already shown a new understanding of how to leverage its increasingly strong hand on agricultural exports. Human immigration is another outcome of the climate change. And Asia, Asian Russia sits atop of 2 billion South Asians from the flooding Mekong Delta and Bangladesh to the sweltering plains of India, many of whom will in, inevitably be pushing northward in search of the space and resources and the climate gets, as the climate has, gets hotter and sea levels continue to rise. In the near term, while Russia may prefer its migrants to come from Central Asia and other countries farther north in the Chinese, and uh, it's the Chinese who seem mostly likely to come. They're already settled throughout the Siberia and the Far East, sometimes through intermarriage with Russian citizens, which makes them eligible for long disembracent benefits or by less from missions received it under government uh, giveaways. Um, and in 2013, Vladimir Putin declared that the remarking of Russia's East is our national priority for entire 21st century. And the current plan invites many Russians uh, willing to relocate themselves in Siberia and the Far East, including the Berbijan area and Jewish autonomous region to buy properties at 2% interest. And Russians willing to move there can also apply for free plots of farmland, college and trade training can also be free. So um, I'm sorry my reading did not match the uh, speed of the, uh, uh, the speed of the slideshow, but that was just a short dive into the story that uh, lasted for three weeks. And I just noticed that it's an enormous uh, body of work that can be done uh, uh, on, on, on that story. And um, 
my main project for 2019 was poverty and i i cannot share images because they were not published yet and they are still under embargo uh, but i think that i will inter uh, merge both projects the climate change and the poverty in russia into one uh, big projects uh, which may uh, become as a as a book project in the um, in, in in some future um, yeah but uh, my plans I, I planned uh, several trips uh, at the mi uh, mid of January and to February and they were um, interfered by political news that I had to cover and uh, so suddenly on January 17 we uh, learned that the opposition leader who was recovering in germany after the um uh after after the uh poisoning uh decide decided to come back to russia and he doesn't have a lot of supporters in russia but uh a lot of russians who are not satisfied with the uh, corruption and uh, uh overall uh state brutality um would would support uh him in uh, in uh in the possible elections uh, that's that's what they think and probably they decided to uh return uh he decided to return back to russia but the police response and the government response was enormous so the man was de detained just uh as soon as he entered russia and the passport control and in two days he was sentenced uh, for 30 days of detention and then for uh, two and a half uh, years in prison for the term that uh, almost expired. And I followed this uh, story and the protests. Um, let me show you pictures. Um, and I followed these, uh, this story and the protests from the first day of uh, arrival. And unfortunately, I'm not uh, having some key images when um, he was detained at the airport or when uh, Navalny was uh, escorted uh, to the uh, to the police van. That that was two short moments when he was kind of exposed to public. Uh, but I had to cover this uh, story also for the New York Times and file on a. Uh, almost hourly basis because uh, Times was uh, uh, making a uh, live coverage uh, with uh, uh, with a very frequent updates and they demanded pictures uh, that were shot straight away. And we had uh, two uh, days of protests uh, on on the twenty third and thirty uh, first of January, and then the third short day uh, when the uh, when Navalny was sentenced for two and a half years in prison. And um, as previously, we were told that this will be mostly uh, teens and youth that will come to the protests. Uh, I witnessed a lot of uh, middle age and even uh, 40 plus uh, people who are his real diehard supporters. And the police response uh, was kind of enormous in their um lawless uh, accusation so they grabbed all people just around the uh the street and accused them in uh chanting slogans or uh arguing with police and then detained them for uh long term like 10 days or 25 days uh, in a detention center and right now we see that the detention centers are overcrowded with uh protesters some some numbers say that it's about um, some, I'm, I'm not sure about the exact number, but I remember that the last uh, I've seen about 1500 in, uh, in Moscow and 10,000 all over the country. Um, yeah, and so that's the last image so far in the story. Uh, it's that's relatives uh, who are collecting donations to their relatives in the in the detention center uh, which is one of them uh, is outside of Moscow and was uh, uh, quickly converted from the detention center for foreign citizens to to keep own citizens in in the prison um, briefly basically um, sorry what was my zoom Yeah. 
briefly, basically, um, that's that's two stories that I wanted to share with you. And thanks for watching. Well, thank you, Sergey, and thank you, Nadia, and thank you, uh, Misha. This is extraordinary presentation. Um, we have quite a bit of time for questions, and the way I'd like to use to do this is just raise your hand. You can raise your hand by clicking the participant button in the bottom of your screen, and I'll see your name pop up here and we'll call on you. And um, you'll just then unmute yourself and ask the question. So I'm sure there's some questions for uh, the speakers. So let's see some hands popping up um, if you have any. Um, Sergey, let me ask the first question. We were talking about this earlier. So um, the demonstration sounds like they've been tabled for um, until the spring. Can you tell us what's going on now? Um, yeah, so the opposition leaders who are who were not detained, all of them who came to Russia were detained and sentenced to uh, stay under house arrest or in prison for, for a long period. And there were just a few of uh, the team members who decided to stay in Russia. So they uh, ruled the game right now and they decided that it's they need to um, they, they, they need to halt those process for a, for a little while. Um, I don't know uh, what are the exact reasons, but you know it's going to be minus 20 in Moscow um, and the, this weekend and there, there were about minus uh, 30 up to minus 60 in some of the uh, other regions. And although the protests are going throughout the whole country, in some 150 cities. So uh, it's a winter season and it's really cold uh, in some of them. So, and probably the other, another reason is just uh, that uh, a lot of people were detained and they need to stand, uh, stay in prison and kind of uh, spend their sentences and then probably came out and maybe they will be even more angry and they will bring more people to to the square for uh, during the next uh, uh, protest because the Belarus uh, example also showed that the protesters used to, I mean, the numbers were used to vanish uh, with each protest. Mm -hmm. they, they can exhaust a lot of people. So um, one participant just uh, said that the raise the hand function is not working. Um, I don't know why. So, um, but Paul Morota had asked, had asked a question. Paul, um, why don't you just unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question. And let me ask other people now to put your questions in the chat since the raise their hand is not working and I'll call on you. So um, Paul, why don't you unmute yourself and ask the question? Sure, thanks Glenn and amazing presentations all. I guess my question is for either Sergey or Misha. Um, as a photographer here in Boston who covers a lot of protests, um, do you ever feel concerned for your own safety, not so much from the protesters, but from police? Are you ever concerned that you might be arrested? Do you feel at risk in any way? Um, yeah, th thanks for your question, Paul. Um, you know, yeah, um, we, we are always concerned about the safety because of most, first of all, our uh, job is to bring in images to public and so while we go to the protest we need to think about the, our way back and uh, uh, sharing our work with uh, uh, with the public so um, so far it seems uh, from my experience covering Moscow protests uh, there is no big threat for uh, journalists uh, we, we heard about some uh, moments some uh, uh, some some stories of uh, uh, journalists being beaten. Um, although the number of journalists covering this protest is uh, uh, enormous, and uh, police is trying to be as much polite as as they can. In in my experience, I can I comparing this to Minsk and to France and other cities. But you know, it's always a matter of. Uh, sudden change and uh, um, so they did not use any um, 
life uh, threatening uh, tools like uh, stun grenades or rubber bullets or anything like that. So mostly they just, they don't even beat people, they just grab and detain them. Um, so yeah, they, they beat occasionally. It's hard to capture, but we are able to ca capture that. But mostly they just uh, try to grab the main activist and then disperse the crowd. Um, and journalists used to wear uh, yellow vests, same as uh, protesters in France. So, and uh, there is no certain rule about that, but it's uh, suddenly happened that all journalists decided to wear this uh, yellow vest and it's kind of mutual agreement between uh, journalists and police that this, uh, uh, this, this will protect them from, uh, from police brutality. Um, Misha had more uh, experience covering the Minsk protests and he can uh, uh, carry on. Yeah, uh, thank you, Sergei. Uh, I just want to add that whatever, like, Sergei, like, I think I can speak for Sergei a little bit and myself is whatever risks and dangers we face in either Moscow or Minsk uh, is that risk is not comparable to the risk that local journalists who are put on the back of the Times or Teams or in you know, AP or Reuters or kind of a powerful agency behind them because they're the ones who take the greater risks and they're the ones who bear the most cost when because what would happen is let's say yeah we may face the same risks in the field if something happened to us i'm pretty sure that if i'm on assignment for getty or the times i don't need to spell the, spell it spell it out for me but the newsroom will be behind, will, will support me but and you know and if i can leave and then if, if the uh, local government doesn't like my work, they will not renew my visa or issue a press card. But what I have seen with my colleagues in Minsk is weeks and months after covering the protest, they would get home visits. They would get beaten and jailed and equipment taken and put to trial. And that is what's happening in Minsk uh, right now. Uh, to people I know. And the reason why we don't hear about it is because none of them are US citizens. None of them were on assignment by kind of Western uh, media. They're just local journalists doing their, the same job that we're doing with the same equipment, same skills. And so whatever it is that we may face is honestly nothing in compared to what these guys are dealing with at this very moment. All right, thank you. We have another question. Um, Emily Bells has a question for Nadia. Emily, why don't you go ahead and unmute yourself. Thanks, Glenn. Um, hi, Nadia. I, uh, I love your work on the aunties and I'm an educator outside Boston and I show it frequently in my classes as a kind of example of this wonderful long-term project. And I wondered if you would talk a little bit about how your view of the house and your aunts changed as you would go back summer after summer to photograph and sort of what the evolution of the vision was. Because it was really exciting for me to see in your presentation some of the images that weren't included in the book. And I just wanted to hear a little bit more from you about um, how, how you saw deeper or how that vision evolved over time. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Getting a little bit of whiplash here, going between the very different kinds of work we're doing. Um, I guess um, at first I was simply curious um, to see something that I remembered, to see how my memory connected with reality. And then by the end, um, it was again um, part of me and I was part of it. Uh, so instead of being a stranger, um, I began to feel a, a kind of an ownership in, in this place and uh, feel a relationship with my aunts that wasn't imaginary or, uh, 
or that of um, a long ago kid, um, but a relationship between people who might not understand each other, but who appreciate each other. So I think, I think that changed slowly over time. I hope that answers it. Thank you. Hey, uh, Nadia, while you're there, there's um, a quick question from Robert Stevens, and I'll just ask it. Do your aunts have any income, like Social Security? Yeah, they, they oh, well, <laughs> I keep talking about them in present tense, but only one of them is still alive. Um, and there is a, a pension that um, that people their age get. It, it's by no means um, livable on, uh, and my dad helps them out as well. Great, thanks. Um, Frank Ward has a question for Misha. Frank? Go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah. No. Good. Uh, Misha, I had the pleasure to uh, review uh, your book uh, for um, Zeke magazine. And uh, it was so rewarding to get the pictures uh, just now that you showed. Um, to be able to see those because I felt that was the hole in the book because Masha had incredible texts about the awful, horrid situation of lives in uh, Minsk and Belarus in general. And I kept thinking, oh, it's like Misha wasn't, you know, he missed the, the uh, boots on the ground part of the story but you didn't miss it. It was bad timing in terms of the cycle of publication because uh, I was really impressed with the, with the work and your, your ability to dive in to such intense situations. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it was, you know, like just imagine, I mean, that was one of the challenges of mm -hmm. documenting this couple is that you know, they're a couple in their 30s living a very kind of, you know, they're not necessarily, you know, Belarus is not North Korea. We, we use this kind of joke, but it's not that far behind. Yeah. And so when you have a couple managing a theater company and li living kind of in a village, you know, like I'm a, I was actually thinking recently that like why isn't the term nonfiction photographer exist like we can, like there's nonfiction writing why I'm a nonfiction photographer and I didn't want to say uh, well why don't you go to a gay club from because I happen to be in town or why don't you do something outlandish um, because we don't do that you know like we manage a theater company it's a full-time job and we have a garden and we raise chickens <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> that's what we do. And so uh, while on stage, you would see all of that, the reality in Minsk is like going to North Korea and saying, like, where are the dead? Where are the concentration camps? Mm. You know, Pinyan is clean. Minsk is clean and is kind of open and fairly quiet and you know, and it's, it's a vast town, but there's, you can't say that there's that much going on. So while the book was structured around Masha's text, visually it was a challenge because it's, you have these two people, but how many portraits of this one couple do you need um, in a book? So it was kind of, yeah, it was interesting to like then spend, what, after the book was done, <laughs> to be in Minsk and seeing all the stuff that was not happening for the three years that I would be going there. <laughs> that having said that, uh, I do hope that if this book does quite well, and it's like 20 bucks, it's sponsored by a great NGO, it's super cheap for a photo book, as you guys know, that there will be room for kind of a second edition That'd where I would have a chance of incorporating all of the, some of the stuff that I showed you and juxtapose them with the, with my, you know, with the earlier theater work and this work about this couple. 
Yeah, well, it's it's a strong book, and uh, you know, it, the I like the intimacy that you manage to get out of the situation, and uh, some of the most amazing pictures of Belarus I had seen. Uh, I was there as a tourist in 2017, I guess, and. Um, you know, I thought uh, you were doing amazing things with what was there, which was kind of highly hidden culture. Yeah, thank you. All right. We have two questions in the chat for Nadia, and I'll, I'll just read both of them, Nadia. Uh, do the aunts have any written accounts, journals, books, or souvenirs, tangible expressions of themselves other than food and clothing? And then the other question, um, how did your aunts feel about your project? Did it take a long time to establish that relationship between you and to accept you as a photographer? And I should say um, who these are from. The first question is by Gwen Elizabeth Bullock. And the second question is by Emily, a different Emily who asked a question earlier. But um, Nadia, if you wanna address those questions. Thank you. Um, I do have some books of recipes, um, records of cross in particular years. There's even some notes about weather, but nothing really personal. After the older aunt, Liftina, passed away, um, I inherited some letters and postcards, and, and all of it is very, very um, impersonal. Um, so I think whatever depths they had, they kept to themselves. Um, and those can only be glimpsed um, and intuited. In terms of, um, what was the second question? Sorry. Um, how did your aunts feel about the project? Mm, that's, that's a tough question. Um, as I said earlier, they're very private people, not used to being looked at. And having, um, having me with the camera there must not have been comfortable. But I think that they, they loved me and pitied me. <laughs> they pitied my state of having a camera permanently attached to my face and, and they allowed me to photograph them. They did see the book. Um, they chose not to comment on it in a positive or negative way, but they did look through it and they did show it to their neighbors. So again, I'm intuiting and guessing. And, and there is a question, um, is there a hidden political message in your intensely personal work? And you commented in the chat, creative nonfiction. Um, can you expand on that maybe? Um, I think all personal stories are political, especially <laughs> if you listen to 70s feminists. And I think that a story of two elderly women who feel that even with their state pension and even with help from their American brother, who feel that they have to grow their own food and make their own clothes and live in this way, I think it, it says something about the whole country. And I think that the lives that my aunts lead are very similar to a lot of people in the country. I think it's really important um, what Misha and Sergei are, are doing. I think it's incredibly important to document protests and um, people who are uh, persecuted by the government. But I also think it's equally important to document the everyday stories, the little stories, the mundane. Um, that's, that's where I come in. Um, and I want to show the days between the protests. I want to show the people who are watching, um, you know, Channel One. Um, and, and I want to show their humanity and also some desperation as well you know, the difficulty of hard labor, and, but then the beauty of their surroundings as well. It's very nuanced for me. It's an important story, really. Can I ask something? Misha, go ahead. Yeah, uh, just, it's, it's, it's a kind of a comment on what to Nadia's work is. A few years ago, I did a story in Russia about basically people like your aunties we, and the driving force behind it was a realization that Russia has the widest life expectancy gap uh, of men and women in the world. What is that? It means that the life expectancy, the difference between life expectancy for men and life expectancy for women is 11 or 12 years. 
So like men die, like the average life expectancy of men is 63 and women is 74, something like that. And it's the widest gap in the world. And as a result, uh, so men die young, like very young. And as a result, like I thought of it when you were showing all of all the work and tasks that they're used to doing and and how, we, you know, a lot of the women, there's basically this expect, expectation uh, that you reach a certain age, there will not be men. You know, like you reach a certain age of around 50, 55, there are no men. Like women, men do not exist. You know, like men just simply are not there. And women have to, uh, learn and have to be able to live and there's a kind of a as you age you just kind of women women accept you know it's passed on generation to generation that after a certain point in life uh there won't be men and uh, <laughs> to slightly contradict you or agree with you is there were never any men uh neither one of my aunts were ever married so they grew up <laughs> Uh, being and, very very uh, self-sufficient so, so the, i don't want to like it's just something that i thought of looking at your work and like and the, the the story that i did was kind of a part of a larger hypothesis was that that this that explains why women especially older women vote for putin and with every single in every single election percentage of votes among women like older women goes up and up and up because he's 67 or 68 right now, and he represents to them um, on TV uh, the sort of kind of a man that simply does not exist in their lives or has never existed. Mm, and, like a, a dream uh, man. A dream man who is like, and the answer is, and I, I wrote the article as well, and when I would ask them, like, what, what, uh, like, what is it about him? And one of the arg pro arguments was that he's not senile, like he's not a drunk, and he's not senile, because they have, they do not, they don't care about anything else. You know, like it, it's a purely aesthetically aesthetic decision, and they just like, you know, the fact that he's in his sixties and he looks normal, you know, he looks presentable, he doesn't slur his speech. Is, is good enough for me. I and, guess the uh, Botox is working. Well, that's no, that's, uh, you know, details. <laughs> that's all. But yeah, so like, you, yeah, the, the cutoff in my project was like, I interviewed about a dozen women and I think the cutoff for me was, I just, I think it was 55. And they all told me that that realization that it's a country of no men comes way earlier that there won't be men. Yeah, I think uh, in a way it's a feminist project as well as it's, it's showing complete self-sufficiency by two elderly women. Yeah, the, <laughs> reminds me of the, the, whoever wrote the headline because as you guys know, like writers and you know, writers, photographers, we don't write headlines. The headline of the article was Babushkas for Putin. So all of that nuanced work was covered by <laughs> Babushkas for Putin, <laughs> but yeah. So, All right, we have you. one more question um, by Susan Sodek. If you're, if you're still here with us, Susan, I'm not exactly clear your question, so it might be better if you ask it of Nadia. Uh, so why don't you unmute yourself, Susan, and ask the question. Well, I was wondering uh, on a long-term project covering various aspects of your auntie's days, months, um, there must have been images that you were had in your mind that as you followed them around. Uh, so were you working with a digital camera so you knew what you had? Uh, or if you were working with film, how, how did you know what you had and what you would like to um, fill in the gaps? How, how you're going to fill in the gaps? I started photographing on film with medium format, but I quickly realized that it was a little bit too bulky and too slow. Um, so when I came back the following year, I came back with a DSLR. By the time I would set up the tripod and my two second exposure, you know, they were on to the next. 
Um, and so with the digital camera, I was a little bit faster um, and I was able to stay out of their way a bit more as well. Mm -hmm. In terms of the images that I wish I had, um, they would always try to get a lot of business done before I showed up, such as washing their clothes and um, anything that involved construction um, so that I would be more comfortable. <laughs> and every time I would come back, they would be very proud of themselves for having just washed their clothing at the, the town's, um, I don't know what to call it, um, Oh man, I'm forgetting my English. Sergey, Misha, help me. Kluch? Key. Istochnik? <laughs> a key or a source? Source, water source. Thank you. There's like a running water source where people go to wash their clothing. Um, and, you know, so the two of them would head off there with a basket of sheets and, mm. and they would wring out their clothing together. And I can see it so clearly in my mind but I never get, get to see it in person because they were always trying to save me from the trouble of walking around with them. Oh, thank you. All right, with that, we'll bring this to a close. I, I really wanna thank our speakers, Nadia, Misha, and Sergey. And I, I wanna thank our sponsor, Digital Silver Imaging, who has um, printed, I think, every exhibit that SDN has done since we started and regularly prints. Um, exhibits for Photoville and other major exhibitions around the US and the world. So I really wanna thank you, Eric, for your support for this program. So what we'd like to do is just to give everybody applause. Um, you can unmute yourself and so they can hear you and see you and really thank you. And this will be- Thank you all. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you, everyone. That was wonderful. I'm oh, good. Thank you. Very excellent. Hi, Nisha. <laughs> He's still muted. Good to see him. Great job, SDN. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, right. really. Top-notch speakers and stories and photographers. Just it's uh, uh all those compelling. So amazing. Hi, yeah. Yeah, they were incredible. Yeah. Hey, I got a question for somebody. Yeah. Just to throw out there. I'm an old guy. I've shot for many years and I'm pretty much retired uh, but I have been compelled just not I just can't let go of it I felt compelled to get back in and to do work that can be meaningful and make a difference right and I'm trying to network and figure out how the heck I can get in the door and be able to network with other people and work on projects that could make a difference uh, and still support myself. I don't have a trust fund. <laughs> so I'm trying to, trying to reinvent myself in this few years that I have left to really make a contribution and help and stuff. So I'm just networking. Well, that's a pretty loaded question. And I don't think in closing, we could really even begin to, <laughs> but um, I, I, just think not. I don't know if you're involved with the social documentary network, but we are a network of thousands of photographers that offer various types of programming to help photographers advance their careers. Um, and you know, if we can't answer your questions, maybe somebody you'll meet during one of these programs can. But thank you for that question and, and, and good luck with your with your work and, and for your caring for your for your desire to really make a difference. My only comment to Don would be um, I hope you have a an internet presence of what you've done in the past so people could get an idea of what your of what you're passionate about so that they have an idea of what they're potentially working with. So again, like, and 
reach out to me or SDN and we can take it offline. Thank you. Yep. All right, thanks everybody. I'm gonna hit the uh, end meeting right. button. Bye everybody, enjoy your weekend. Bye. Thank you so much. Take care everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah.